evening, everyone. I want to welcome you all to the Noah Webster House and West Hartford Historical Society. For those of you who've never been here before, welcome. For those of you who are returning, um, thank you for coming again. We're so pleased to have you all here for one of our conversations, a community forum, which is sponsored by the Hartford Foundation for Public Giving. We typically hold two of these every year, and we started planning this back in the fall when this topic of mascots began to be heard here in West Hartford. And we really were thinking about West Hartford in terms of the whole country. Yes, it's happening here, but it's something that has happened all over the country, and it's a continuing conversation that you know happens not only locally, but on a national level with national sports teams. And of course, you, you can't ignore it here in, in the town of West Hartford. It's something that's kind of been all over the news and, um, and just something people are always talking about. So we wanted to provide uh, you know, a safe, warm, welcoming place where people could talk about all the different sides. Um, I know people have lots of different opinions about you know, mascots and um, names and logos. And of course, the Board of Education's decision last week is also very interesting as well. Um, and I'm sure that has even produced more questions and, and you know, various feelings about whether, um, what to do about that decision. Um, so um, tonight we've, we've gathered a group of really great people who will help share some insight on the topic. Then we want to open it up to the audience. One of the things we had difficulty finding for tonight was somebody who was willing to stand up and talk in favor of keeping the mascots. Um, and we were a little disappointed about that. So during the, qu the question part um, and the, the community dialogue, um, we would love to hear from anyone who, who is of that um, persuasion and why. Um, we really just want to keep this an open talk that really is just talking about all the different sides and um, just being really open about it. So to start our conversation, I would like to introduce Lori Lamar. She's the executive director of the Institute for American Indian Studies in Washington, Connecticut. She previously has worked at the Mashantucket Pequot Museum and Research Center, the Lebanon Historical Society, and the Mattituck Museum in Waterbury. She holds degrees in history and anthropology from the University of Connecticut, and a master's degree in museum studies and museum education from Tufts University. And Ms. Lamar will be our moderator for tonight's panel. Thank you. Uh, so good evening. Uh, I'm Lori. It's nice to meet you all, and uh, thank you for coming out tonight. It's uh, an exciting evening, I think, especially with uh, everything happening here in West Hartford, so close to home. Uh, so what I'd like to do is introduce our three panelists tonight, and then, of course, invite them to come up one by one, and kind of you can hear their perspectives. So first, I'd like to introduce uh, right directly here to my left is Christopher Noel. Christopher is a Passamaquoddy, born and raised on the Indian Township Reservation in Eastern Maine. Chris resides in Connecticut, right on the Mashantucket Reservation currently, and he's recently graduated as a student through UConn Center for Continuing Studies. He's a member of the Mystic River Singers, based out of Ledger, Connecticut, and has traveled across the US and Canada singing at powwows and cultural events. Chris also works in the field of Native education and is passionate about sharing his experiences growing up on the reservation and his transition to off-reservation life. Much of his work in Native education revolves around the history of representation of Native America through mainstream media. To Chris's left is Dr. Tracy Wilson. Tracy is the West Hartford Town Historian. She teaches history at Connard High School in West Hartford and is also taught at Trinity College and St. Joseph's College. She holds a bachelor's and master's degrees from Trinity College and a PhD from Brown. Her publications include studies of women workers at Colts and Travelers and in the Connecticut Women's Suffrage Movement and frequent columns in local newspapers. Hi, Tracy. Uh, <laughs> to the left is Elizabeth Devine. Uh, Liz, or Elizabeth Devine, teaches social studies and human rights at Hall High School in West Hartford. Among her many accomplishments and awards is the New England History Teachers Association Teacher of the Year awarded in 2008. So I, I hope that everyone will share with me in giving them a warm welcome. And 
I'd first like to ask Dr. Wilson to come up and join us. Thank you. Oh, no, I didn't. Uh, thank you, Lori, and thanks to the Noel Webster House for uh, setting up this forum and um, for asking me to be part of it. Um, it's really nice to see you all here, and um, I think a discussion like this sometimes gets people to the Noel Webster House who may never have been here before, so I think that's a, uh, that's a, um, a, a really good thing that the Noel Webster House is, is inviting this conversation. Um, I just want to make two two points really to put this discussion in context. And I guess my first comes out of being in this house where Noah Webster is a man who thought a lot about words and the importance of words. And so I think it's really, um, as we've used the word interesting a lot of times tonight already, um, that uh, we, we are seeing through this conversation that we've had this year just how powerful words can be, and that words are um, important symbols as well, and um, that they have a lot of meaning. And our Board of Education, uh, probably t tomorrow night, will we'll do the final vote um, in which they will say that uh, the words warrior and chieftain can remain, but we kind of need to rebrand them. and. Um, they're saying that we cannot have any uh, symbols that represent a warrior or a chieftain as a native person. Um, so, you know, I guess I, I think back to Webster thinking about what the meaning of words are, and I, I'm going to be really interested to see how and if um, and when that transformation can, can be made. Uh, because so many of us have lived in this town for a long time with these words that have had particular meanings and particular symbols that have gone with them. And now um, we're going to try and change that. Um, and so I'm going to be really interesting, interested to see how that can happen um, with a town that I would say is still really split on this issue. Um, so I'll be, you know, we'll all be watching that and, and many of us participating in it over the next uh, year, a couple of years probably. Um, and so I just want to talk a little bit about the history of um, not going way back about Native uh, people in West Hartford, but um, I guess since the 1950s when the town started naming things after Native people. Um, and. Um, in the mid-1950s, uh, there was a road that went along uh, Trout Brook, Trout Brook and then became uh, King, uh, they it named it King Philip. And uh, most of you would know, though many of my students think King Philip is a Spanish king, um, is actually named after a, a native person, Medicom, um, who was a Wampanoag Indian. And, um, uh, um, a little bit later, they named the school, the, which is now a middle school in town, after King Philip. And, um, you know, people wonder why. Um, and me too. Uh, so I looked back in the records and found out that uh, as they were building it, they called it the King Philip Street School. And then, if you read through the minutes, uh, at, at some point they say, okay, we're not going to call it the King Philip Street School anymore, we're going to call it King Philip School. And so that seemed to be the extent of the discussion on this issue. Um, and it, it's sort of interesting because in our discussion over the course of the last six months, um, some people have said, well, if we change the mascot, then are we going to change the names of uh, the street names, of which there are many uh, native street names in the area around the King Phillips School, and are we going to change the, the, uh, the name of this middle school? And um, in, in my mind, uh, I, I really see those as, as quite different things. Um, generally, you use a street name or a school, the name of a school as something to honor somebody. Um, and you know, you don't, you don't get a, um, a character of it, um, and people don't sort of wear it on their sleeve, but it's the, you're naming something. Um, and every year in my class, my students uh, have the assignment of deciding whether, in fact, we should continue to call King Philip School, King Philip School. Is, is King Philip really somebody we should be honoring? And what about him 
um, makes him worthy or not worthy of having a school named after him. So um, I think it, it really leads us to some interesting discussions after we study uh, the war, uh, which happened in uh, somewhat in this area between 1675 and 1676. Um, so um, just a little bit before this discussion is going on, I'll pass this around. Um, Hall High School uh, was built in 1924. It was named after the superintendent of schools who consolidated the schools in town. Uh, but it existed as a school for quite a long time before they uh, had a mascot. And this little article appears in the Hartford Current in November of 1952. Um, and this article says they're now going to call themselves the Warriors. And they had a contest in the school and a junior uh, put the name in and that's what they chose to be their mascot. Um, when the school got overcrowded and they built a new school, Connard, right, right down the hill from here in 1957, if you look at the first issue of our uh, newspaper, which uh, is called the Pow Wow, um, they uh, said that uh, Connard's mascot would be a chieftain. So. My guess is it came off of this. There's no reason that they give there for why it was chosen, um, but that's when the, the naming happened. Um, so as far as the history of the mascots in the school, um, uh, when I first came to Conard in 1979, uh, there were still people who, um, you know, we, we had a mascot in which, uh, we actually had a costume, and Liz, you'll remember this, um, kids would actually compete to be the person every year who would wear this costume. Um, and uh, I think they elected maybe two of them every year. Um, they would go out on the basketball court and do a war dance. Um, they would do sort of hollers, which they, um, I guess, liken to what Native people did. Um, but in the early 80s, they uh, decided that wasn't really appropriate. and so. Um, according to the, um, um, I think you maybe know the story better than I do, but according to the um, uh, athletic director, somebody s just took the costumes and hid them uh, so that they couldn't be used anymore. So even in the early 80s, people are thinking, maybe this isn't really so appropriate. Uh, maybe this isn't something we should be doing. Um, there's, a, there's actually a picture in, the, um, uh, in our yearbook from the late 70s of the principal of the school and two of the vice principals wearing these costumes and um, out on the, on the basketball court. Um, and certainly in the last few years, we, we, we haven't had that in the last 30 years. But I, I do think that was a sign that there were people who thought that this was not an appropriate um, use of uh, another culture's culture. Um, in the early 90s, there was another short push to end the mascot. In fact, uh, Liz and I uh, spoke with the mayor about this issue, and he told us that w when he was at Hall High in the early 90s, um, he, um, he was part of a movement to end the use of the mascot. Um, that was in, I think, 1992. It um, uh, didn't get anywhere, but uh, there were sort of rumblings about it at that point. Um, and then in um, 2012, uh, there was a student, a particular student at Hall, who um, really worked at getting rid of the, of the native mascot as a project in school. And um, she, um, she uh, uh, worked really hard at this and tried to get some allies. And um, it, it ended up um, at the end of the school year that, in fact, the principal had said, OK, we'll have the name. Um, but we'll get rid of the images. Um, so again, an, an understanding that perhaps this wasn't the, um, this wasn't the way we should um, be depicting Native people. And uh, for the girl who, who did this, she, she, really, um, she really had a hard time. Uh, at the end of the school year, she um, did not go to her own graduation because of the way she had been uh, treated by others in the school. Um, so it was really rough. Um, her, her battle. Um, so, um, and, and then this year, many of you know the story of, of how this became a, a, big, um, a big issue this year. Um, back in September, our two fan groups, the reservation and the tribe, uh, were at a soccer game and some um, um, 
anti-Semitic remarks uh, and sort of bullying kinds of things happened and, and um, which, uh, as you were saying, you can't really control it in an athletic contest. And the principal sent out a letter to um, all the parents, all the teachers in town saying, you know, we do not accept um, culturally insensitive remarks, racist remarks, anti-Semitic remarks. And there were a group of students who said, well, we, we consider the mascot to be that. And uh, you, you've told us that we can't do that, uh, so um, why are you allowing this? Um, and out of that um, grew a movement which um, has really gotten people energized in town uh, over the power of this, uh, this word and this image. And um, I would say has, has, brought us, um, has brought us where we are now. So I think I'll, I'll stop at that, and if anyone has further questions, um, then we'll, we'll go from there. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wilson. Um, I could say a number of things, but I won't. I'll just invite the next speaker out, and I'll get some moderating, so I should moderate, correct? Um, so I'd like to invite Elizabeth up. Liz. Thank you. I can see you're writing those notes there. Yeah, I can see that. All right. Hi, everybody. I'm Liz Devine, Paul High School teacher. Actually started at Conard with Tracy in 1978 so, um, and moved over to Hall in 1982. So I am actually going to read to you what I, said, what I started to read at the town council forum, but then it was cut off. And I really like what I said. <laughs> I really like it, and I like it because it really takes me to my point. I have a little bit of a different perspective. Um, I'm not the town historian. Um, I'm not a native person. But as a history teacher, I'm approaching it this way. So, I, and forgive me, but I'm going to read it because otherwise I'll forget to say what I want to say. So, um, so this is how I started my the town council, um, or the town, not the town council forum, the, the the board of ed forum. The journey into my position on the mascot issue was personal. As a U.S. history teacher in West Hartford, I thought I knew about the history of Native people and the complicated relationship between our government and Indian people. However, my knowledge about Native issues was impacted by travel west. Since the 1990s, my husband and I have uh, taken our children west and visited several Indian reservations. It was there on the Crow and Blackfoot reservations of Montana and the Navajo and Hopi reservations of Arizona that I learned about Indian sovereignty and voice. How did I not understand how language, ceremony, and the land shaped the life experience of natives? I was surprised by the perspectives I heard at Wounded Knee and at Canyon de Chez. Why was their history not mentioned in my books? So I started to read, I asked a lot of questions, and then brought in guest speakers, and followed native voices in the arts and online. I was embarrassed by my ignorance and um, my naivete about Indian tribal sovereignty and the many political, social, and economic issues confronting Native populations across the country. Most of all, I knew I had so much more to learn. That's why in August, I contacted Frank Wallen, a Lakota musician from the Rosebud Reservation, inviting him to West Hartford. Uh, it had nothing to do with mascots, per se, and everything to do with exposing my students to the culture and political reality of living as an indigenous person in America. For me, my journey on this mascot issue is about exposure and perspective. This is where my journey takes me back to Hall High School. My colleague, uh, a science teacher, Mike Rawlins, taught me about systems theory years ago. I now use this approach in my classes and have been thinking about this in theory to the re in, in relation to the mascot issue. So just bear with me for a bit. Systems theory has us look at the small details that exist within the realm of a larger picture. Both views are necessary to understand an issue. I've come to understand the local issue here in West Hartford is one of tradition. I've also learned about the global issue of how mascots are perceived by the wider native community in Indian country and beyond. Mascots are seen by many, not all, Indian people as a way to trivialize and disrespect native culture. So here in West Hartford, we see the mascot as a form of honor and tradition, yet when we telescope out to the wider world, mascots are seen as demeaning and hurtful. Recently, CNN had an editorial by Simon Moya Smith, which in part stated, on the whole, people can recognize what's anti-black, anti-gay, anti-Latino, anti-Asian, and so on. But when it comes to racism directed at Native Americans, we, the first people of the continent, are left to having to explain why Indian uh, mascots denigrate us. 
end quote. Part of this answer may be the system, one for so, where for so long it seemed as if Native people were invisible or represented in the media and in history books has disappeared. In fact, in an interview with Frank Wallen, the Lakota rapper who, who's coming in, in, in April, he told this anecdote um, about being on an elevator in Chicago where he now lives and having another person compliment him on his braids. This person asked Frank, where are you from? He responded that he was from here. We, he came from South Dakota. He was an Indian. And her response was, I thought you were all dead. I was provoked by this and then thought more about the idea of my exposure. I did not grow up with Indian people, never went to school with anyone who identified with Indians, nor did I even meet any in college. I had zero exposure and almost no understanding of the culture, traditions, issues of Indian country. I saw myself as understanding, and I still do, as compassionate and educated, that I was really pretty clueless. It wasn't until my adult years that I began to hear and listen to the voices of those I so easily dismissed as a mascot or a name on a car. I don't have to be Indian to understand the hurt connected with being ignored and treated as a stereotype. All you must understand this. I don't have to be Indian to want a voice, and I don't have to be Native to want to be proud of my culture. These are part of the system in place for all humans. However, if I'm under, to understand the whole picture of mascots, then I can't ignore those Indian voices. True, Native people don't all agree on this issue. These are the smaller details. However, the perspective of identity is clear in Indian country. Indian people have a voice, and the majority of tribal people believe that misappropriation of their culture and heritage is disrespectful, no matter what the intent. So exposure and perspective have brought me here tonight. So how do I teach Native issues? Well, I make sure that I include the voices of their historians, and there are many of them, and I use their books in my class. I've also educated myself on Indian boarding schools. I visited Carlisle, Pennsylvania, one of the first, and have read the stories of those who attended these schools, and now share these with my students. In addition, I show a film called Our Spirits Don't Speak English, made, by the way, and directed by all Indian filmmakers. I've also used the films like Real Engine with my students to discuss the role of media in perpetuating stereotypes. Finally, I have had the opportunity to bring in many speakers to my classroom to expose my students to Indian country. Stephen Pivar uh, is not an Indian gentleman, however, he's an ACLU lawyer, comes from West Hartford, the Hall parent, who spent four years on the Rosebud Reservation in South Dakota. He comes to my class to discuss important court cases that have stripped Indians of their rights and more recently restored Indian sovereignty. I'm also cognizant of Indian voices today. In our American Studies class, we read Sherman Alexie's book, The True Diary of a Part-Time Indian. Um, I, re I read Indian Country Today online, which is an online newspaper, just to find out what's going on. And I think it's my responsibility to understand the political, cultural, and economic issues so I can share these with my students. I've had in Delphine Redshirt from the Pine Ridge Reservation, and, and she, uh, she wrote a book called Beat on an Ant Hill about her experience. Joseph Firecrow from the Cheyenne Reservation, as well as Ed Saravia from the Indian Affairs Council of Connecticut. All of these speakers expose my students to the Native world and issues confronting Indian uh, Native peoples. Tomorrow, my human rights students are having a fundraiser for Hawkwind. Glastonbury res uh, resident Rochelle Ripley coordinates a nonprofit focused on helping those on the Cheyenne River Reservation in South Dakota. We've already raised $1,000 this year. We'll hold several more fundraisers. The students in the coalition have learned the history of this reservation and are trying to help replenish the food bank, the school library, and the children's program on the reservation. Exposure and perspective give our students the tools to understand complex issues and to act. While not all my students agree about the use of Indian images and mascots, I'm quite sure they're fully aware of the complexity of issues in Indian country. And when confronted with the issue of misappropriation and stereotyping, they understand the history and context of these issues. I believe this context is key to making informed decisions about mascots and about imagery in the community. I'm going to end this way. Tracy, you're going to like this. Tracy and I have run two trips to South Africa, and there's a Zulu word that I think fits here. It's the, uh, the word is Ubuntu. It's a philosophy, really, for how to live life. Ubuntu can be summarized as an affirmation that recognizes our humanity and connectedness. And this is, what, this is what I'm left with, and I think this is important for our students to understand. I am what I am because of who we all are. I'm busy writing my notes for our conversation later. Um, thank you very much, Liz. Um, and with that, I'll, wake up, I'll welcome our third speaker, uh, Christopher Newell. So thank you. All right. 
I brought a few pictures for you guys today to go along with my presentation. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Chris Newell. I'm a pastor from Quaddy Indian, Reser uh, raised on the Indian Township Reservation in Eastern Maine. And um, I'm going to be talking about native mascotry in general, a little bit bigger picture uh, when we're talking about this subject. So I'm going to in introduce the, uh, the term native mascotry for you, which was coined by a longtime friend of mine named Jacqueline Keeler, who I went to school with at Dartmouth College uh, in my younger years. Now, uh, here we are with the Dartmouth Native American, uh, Native Americans of Dartmouth. Uh, I was one of those uh, young students way back when, so was Jackie. And according to Jackie, native mascotry is a term I appropriated to describe the practices that surround a native mascot. It's not just about the static image of the mascot, be it somewhat noble and prosaic, or an ugly caricature with a feather on top. It's the creative license such mascots give fans to reenact outdated stereotypes to play Indian. These practices include the wearing of red face, the misuse of native regalia, and the chanting of fake hokey war chants and tomahawk chops. My time at Dartmouth taught me more than just math, science, and liberal arts. Dartmouth College works very much like a community, and I learned a lot about the world there as well. I was fresh off the reservation. Uh, this was a little bit overwhelming for me in the beginning because of my freshness off the reservation, and I didn't have a lot of experience with life in mainstream America. My roommates listened to music that was foreign to me. Uh, people ate food I'd never seen before. Uh, so I spent a lot of time trying to figure out where my place in this society would be. But Dartmouth has a way of taking Native students and putting them at the forefront of campus politics, deciding your place for you, particularly when it came to the officially retired, unofficial mascot of Dartmouth College, the Dartmouth Indian. I didn't have a choice. Being at Dartmouth meant confronting this beast of a burden. Luckily for me, though, there was the NAD community for me to fall back on, the Native Americans at Dartmouth. I had several outlets for the immense amount of pressure the subject can put on a Native student going through the Dartmouth experience. And for me, the healthiest of, of these uh, outlets was music. It was my savior, and in a lot of ways, if it were not for music, I'm not sure what I would have done. That's me and the Mystic River Singers right there. Based out of Connecticut here, a group we've traveled all over the country, uh, celebrating music, native culture, uh, everywhere we go. Now, I come from a small, fairly isolated reservation in Maine. Indian Township in our language is called Madakmiguk. Somehow, up to that point in my life, I've never really run into the issue of native masketry before my arrival at Dartmouth. I was so naive that I believed the rhetoric that mascots were meant as a form of honor for natives. My time at Dartmouth would change that assertion forever. Images of the Dartmouth Indian, although long since retired, still abound on campus. Alumni keep the tradition alive, hearkening the days of old at reunions and sports events. Their days were a time when the Dartmouth Indian reigned. And there we are with the Dartmouth Indian right there at a football game. Now, take a look at this picture, um, just for a second. Um, I think we can all agree that wearing blackface in today's society is something that would not be socially acceptable. But, for some reason, wearing red face is. That's what native mascotry allows. Um, <clears throat> now, uh, in 2015, we all know a little bit better. Um, and so hopefully we're going to start doing better. And, uh, and when it comes to this fight with native mascotry, uh, ever since it started more than 50 years ago, over 90% of native mascots in all different levels of sports have been retired. So this has been uh, successful, but there are still holdouts. Now, uh, red face is the same as someone dressing up as blackface, yet the tradition surrounding sports, and especially native mascots, lays the groundwork where this behavior is not only accepted, but heartily encouraged. My first and only experience at a home game at Dartmouth football was enough for me. The chant of Wahoo Wah 
A non-native student's imagined spirit cheer, written decades ago, echoes at random times during the games by those who think they're upholding a grand tradition. There were people in native-inspired face paint in the crowd. There were girls luluing at every big play, and if anybody knows what that means, that's the ululating sound that you will often hear women make, uh, especially with Plains tribes. Um, it was enough for me. My culture to this crowd had become a cartoon version of itself, and that's not even the worst of it. The Ivy League competitive tradition, Ivy League schools are very, very competitive with one another when it comes to sports. It called for all the schools to lampoon or make fun of the upcoming competition. So images like these still exist and pop up from time to time. So these are some of the programs that you would see if you would travel to another school when Dartmouth was on their way. Uh, imagery that was sometimes, that did not project the uh, proud, never say die warrior that Dartmouth wanted it to. Um, in fact, sometimes the pictures were somewhat grotesque. And other, uh, other times they were downright insulting. If you notice what they're uh, uh, chopping at there, that football's got a fuse hanging out of it. So not showing natives in the most positive or intelligent light whatsoever. The decision to change the mascot is never easy. Uh, I can imagine what the uh, folks, uh, the school board for these two schools have gone through. Um, and in this case, they came up with, an, well, you know, we've said this word before, an interesting compromise. I'm happy to see native imagery taken out of their sports mascots, if that's what truly happens. I'm also happy that traditions like cheering sections, like the reservation, are getting retired. Um, because I grew up on a reservation. Um, reservations were where Native Americans were forced to go to live with the idea that life would become so hard for them that they would eventually want to leave their land base and se cease to exist as a nation. Um, that was the purpose of them. So I was struck by a quote from one of the school board members in this fight. Uh, I read it in the Hartford Current. Um, and I don't want to pick on this person, so I won't say their name, but I am going to pick on what they said. Um, this person in their remarks said in regards to native masketry, opponents may refer to this imagery as subtle racism, but that would be an opinion. Native Americans face many challenges, but racism as a result of high school nicknames and imagery is simply not one of them. That was one of the quotes given by one of those that wanted to keep the name. Now that's a whopper of a declaration coming from somebody who doesn't live in a native community. Uh, it's typical of the type of attitude we run into when we talk about this issue. We're told how we're supposed to feel and the way we're supposed to feel about it and that it's not that big of a deal. Well, for me, it was a big deal. It did affect my life negatively, and it stuck with me for a long time. The psychological aspects of native mascots were studied by the American Psychological Association, and in 2005, they released the results of their study. They recommended ending the use of native mascots at all levels of sports. The APA called for an, quote, immediate retirement of all American Indian mascots, symbols, images, and personalities by schools, colleges, and universities, athletic teams, and organizations because of, once again, quote, harmful effects of racial stereotyping, inaccurate racial portrayals, including the particularly harmful effects of American Indian sports mascots on the social identity development and self-esteem of American Indian young people. Now, in my life story, these things happen to me. Unfortunately, when you're going through it, you don't really understand what's causing it. And it did lead to some depression for me. I had a lot of trouble adjusting. <clears throat> the APA also concluded that the use of native mascots, and I'm quoting again, this is what their findings came out, to be, uh, they undermine the educational experiences of members of all communities, especially those who have little or no contact with indigenous peoples. So we're cheating the students at these high schools out of a real education 
because we're teaching them all the wrong things. Uh, the powwow and the, you know, the reservation, all of these different images that are being used in uh, ways that uh, don't follow their meaning. Um, the symbols and images and mascots teach non-Indian children that it's acceptable to participate in culturally abusive behavior and perpetuate inaccurate misconceptions about American Indian culture. They also concluded that it establishes an unwelcome and oftentimes hostile learning environment for American Indian students that affirms negative images and stereotypes that are promoted in mainstream society and that it undermines the ability of American Indian nations to portray accurate and respectful images of their culture, spirituality, and traditions. Now the APA, in my opinion, did a very good job of speaking for me because these are all the things that I felt going through my experience uh, with Native Masketry. And for me, this, reading this was you know, uh, very uh, heartening for me because it was like they reached into my soul and they were found what really was bothering me and were able to put it in words. So um, the following examples I'm going to show you exemplify every aspect of the study. And I can report from personal experiences that it does affect the self-esteem of young natives in a negative way. My experiences mirror what this study concludes. In fact, reading it for the first time was such a huge relief um, because it was like they spoke to me. So first we'll begin at the professional level, which is the most visible. Uh, there's a first one right there, Cleveland Indians fan. Um, you know, the, uh, the history of scalping, um, not exactly a proud moment in US history. I'm not exactly sure why this should be accepted, uh, but uh, when it comes to native masketry, it's, it's a common, uh, common occurrence. Now we also have this picture right here. Not very flattering if you're a native person looking at this image, okay? We've got an Eagles fan playing the Washington Redskins. And um, this fan is so fanatic about what he does that he goes to other sporting events and does the exact same thing. And as you notice in this particular picture, this is a television screenshot right here. This guy's image was shown on national television. That's what the American public sees when it comes to native masketry in sports. Uh, here's a couple guys at last year's Arizona-Washington game. Uh, they were, uh, uh, you know, once again, red face shows itself again, socially acceptable in this environment, where it should not be acceptable at all in any environment. <coughs> Um, occasionally, our uh, message does hit the mainstream media, so this is a little bit of lampooning of uh, uh, the idea of native masketry, but um, occasionally these things play out in real life. And as you can see here, this is from 2014, this is not ancient history. Um, all the images I'm showing you are from the last year or so. Um, and there, right here we have a protester on the left. Uh, being confronted by a Cleveland Indian fan on the right, painted in red face, trying to make his case that what he is doing is honoring him. And as you can see by the facial expression, he is not really feeling the honor. Um, now this one right here doesn't really need that much explanation. This actually appeared last year. Um, you know, you can read the words for yourself. And uh, neither does this one. Um, this is a, uh, a fan of uh, the Washington Redskins team. Um, you might think this is an isolated fan, uh, fan, but actually this gentleman blogs about dressing up like this and about the positive attention he gets at the tailgate parties by the other fans, often taking pictures with many, many different people. Um, as noted in the APA study, Native Masketry has a tendency to make people feel it's okay to mock Native culture. This is pervasive outside of the sports world as well. One of the hot themes lately at college campuses are cowboys and Indians parties. All right, not very flattering and once again, not very representative of real native culture. Uh, every Halloween, I have to take my kids to buy their costume and I gotta see these guys. These are what's sold in mainstream stores. Once again, not accurate. And since 
Everyone seems to be in on co-opting native culture for fashion. It is fashionable these days for the world of fashion to put a woman in a skimpy outfit in a man's headdress and call it hip. Now, we have a problem with violence against native women. One in three will experience um, violence in their lifetime, eight out of 11 of those by non-native perpetrators. And so to project this image and to sexualize our women in this way is very offensive to a lot of the women um, in our culture. <clears throat> so uh, it happens more often than you think. Um, and then there's this guy. <laughs> uh, he's right in Times Square. Um, this is, uh, there's a guy who calls himself the Naked Indian. Um, he, originally there was a guy called the Naked Cowboy. These guys take pictures with people at Times Square. They make a lot of money. Okay, this guy saw the Naked Cowboy and said, hey, I'll be the Naked Indian. Gotta work for me. And he's out there every day uh, in his underwear with a drum with that fake headdress uh, making money. Uh, you know, basically because of the stuff he's learned from mainstream media. So pro-masketry is definitely a problem for the self-esteem of uh, Native youth. Uh, at the collegiate level, uh, it's not much better. Uh, there's Chief Vilaniwek, uh, former mascot for the University of Illinois. Um, and this is where I had the most trouble with it. In fact, a good friend of mine, an artist and fellow NAD, Named Anna Sukalarkis recently had an art installation at Dartmouth at the Hopkins Center for the Art. Um, and so she, what she did was she took a survey of Native students asking very simple questions, allowing those students to take their time to explain different aspects of their uh, experiences at Dartmouth. So this is the installation right here. And she, uh, basically this, uh, she let the art the, the words create the art. She took the, uh, the themes that were most often prevalent in these surveys, and these are what made it to onto the wall. Now, out of the 47 responses that did make it as part of this art piece, you will see the words, do not forget who you are. You will see coming face to face with the issue of native masketry. Non-natives saw me and my peers as walking caricatures being guarded against non-natives. What your identity means to others is how you're defined. And I never felt so belittled as I did fighting the symbol issue. And so these are actual native students putting their Dartmouth experience out there for the world to see anonymously. But you get kind of the picture that it does negatively affect the students who have to go through this. And Dartmouth retired their Indian mascot. They no longer have it anymore. But there are those who would still hold up the tradition, um, pretending as if something was taken away from them, you know, especially the alumni who were around when the symbol was part of the Dartmouth experience. Um, now here's one that's particularly troubling, the college level. Um, as you can see, the OSU students here hashtag the Trail of Tears. Um, the 1830 Indian Removal Act was uh, once again a dark spot on American history. That's the forced removal of thousands and thousands of natives, Cherokees and other Southwest tribes into Oklahoma, where as many as three or 4,000 people forced to walk that distance died on the way. Um, something that we really shouldn't be celebrating, uh, especially as uh, you know, uh, a dig at somebody uh, for a sports game. Um, now, the statement I read to you earlier mentioned high school students. I have some for that as well. Um, right here, last year at McAdory High School in Alabama, the faculty advisor for the pep squad went on vacation during football playoff season. The school they were playing had a native mascot, and unfortunately, the students chose the wrong words to show their school spirit. They didn't have any faculty advice in this case. Um, and so, once again, we see the trail of tears being added into uh, a sports uh, event. Uh, just something that should not be celebrated. Remembered, of course, studied, understood, but it should not be held up 
uh, or used as a dig for somebody to get at you in a sports, um, uh, in a sports arena. Um, and you might think this is somewhat isolated. However, during the same weekend in Tennessee, we have another football game here where on furl on the sideway, sideline, uh, a school play, uh, called the Diesberg Trojans playing against another school called the Northside Indians when the game got out of hand and furled this banner on the side of the sidelines. Um, so uh, there we are, some examples right from the high school level. And so the notion that uh, high school students do not experience racism as a result of native mascots is a fallacy. Um, and I'll straight up say that. Um, they do. It's not an opinion. This really happens. Um, but even with the elimination of native mascots, there still remains the corrupted attitudes that her have endured over their tenure. Um, last week in Lancaster, New York, uh, the school board chose the wise route of retiring their Redskins mascot in favor of an undetermined new mascot in order to foster school spirit in a positive manner that is conducive to all involved. However, pro-mascot students often encouraged by alumni parents chose to protest and walk out of school after the decision. And as you can see by the sign, um, somebody chose Tonto Speak as the medium to convey their message. I'm not sure if you guys can read that, the sign that's being held up says, school board speak with forked tongue. These are guys that were protesting to keep the mascot. And so um, I don't think they're really helping themselves here. I mean, it really makes the point of why we need to get rid of these mascots, because they are learning all of the wrong things. Um, now, the shot in the arm that forced this decision with the Lancaster School was the boycott of lacrosse games by three other schools in the district. These schools have high native enrollments and the sport of lacrosse is a, uh, has a spiritual nature for people of the Haudenosaunee or the Iroquois Confederacy. Um, they call it the creator's game. And after a public announcement of the name change, a comment from a native parent on Facebook, I won't name them, uh, but the words are pretty powerful, says that lacrosse is more than a game for us. It is also one of our medicines. Players must compete with a good mind in order to protect the spirit with which the game must be played. Our young people boycotted Lancaster Redkin Redskins. This victory belongs to them. It is our youth who will lead us. So this was a native-led movement against the school to get them to change their mascot. So the bottom line is native mascotry is a problem at all levels. And the declaration that native high school students don't have to deal with racism as a result of native mascots is wrong. If it's institutionalized as it is in high schools across the nation, then it becomes okay for non-natives to belittle, denigrate, and disrespect native cultures of this land. And in the process, you miss out on learning some amazing things and learning about some amazing people. All right, one of whom is my father over there who spent pretty much his entire life. I have a cousin in the background over there. So um, you know, pretty much spent his entire life working in the field of education, spent over 40 years working on our language preservation. We now have um, a dictionary with uh, over 2,000 pages. Uh, as well as an online website, several video series, um, and he performs for the Smithsonian Folklife series every once in a while. You'd also miss our art. Uh, these are some Passamaquoddy fancy baskets right here. So these things are not included in native masketry. You don't learn about them when you, uh, when you um, la uh, latch on to those types of images. Here's a birch bark canoe and art. My people are reviving. Um, these canoes were once an amazing piece of technology. They are lightweight. Uh, they can go on the ocean as well as the rivers, and they were our cars of long ago. The rivers were our highways. Um, also, this is a birch bark basket made by a friend of mine named David Moses Bridges, very talented artist who also made the, uh, the birch bark canoe that you saw there. And you'd also miss out on our music. 
Um, there's someone in the back here that's, uh, I, I see her smiling at me. I don't w wish to point her out, but um, Native music really uh, is a beautiful thing. And it do doesn't come in one shape or form. It comes in all different shapes or forms. Um, and it's really an expression of culture. It's one of the ways that we keep it alive today. Uh, and also the dance. You know, uh, you know you're missing out on real, uh, authentic Native dance. Dances that have survived um, through uh, Native encroachment, or through non-Native encroachment onto our lands and all of our history. Now here's your real Dartmouth Indians. As you notice, don't look anything like the picture I showed you before. All right, these are all graduating students. Um, the Dartmouth College Native American program has a tradition of giving Pendleton blankets to students when they graduate. And so these promising young individuals right here have gone on to become lawyers and educators. Um, and Dartmouth grads have made their way um, all the way up to working for directly under President Obama. Um, so um, here's your real Native America as well. And once again, no representation of this looks at all like what you would see at a sports event. So let's honor Native culture, but let's honor it by being educated and by respecting one another. And that's it for me. Thank you very much. I would just like to um, thank all three, uh, Liz and Dr. Wilson and, and Chris. I thought that was an incredible, um, three different perspectives, but also kind of seeming sharing clearly the same perspective. Uh, but I think the knowledge that came across in these three presenters was, um, it, it really did just blow me away versus the history of the local area and um, Chris's perspective, native perspective and also, you know, the educator's perspective um, uh, in the classroom where these students are, you know, participating in these conversations. So I was, you know, of course, taking notes and circling words uh, to have a conversation, but I wanted to allow some Q&A from the audience um, for at least a little while, and then maybe perhaps I'll sum up um, uh, and quote, unquote, moderate those questions and, and that summation. Uh, so I guess I'd like to welcome questions from the audience. If there's any. <laughs> Would anybody like any praise or suggestions? I got you. Okay. Um, <laughs> so I guess my question is that um, now that the Board of Ed decision has, you know, has been kind of done, um, like what is our, like where are we going like from here? Do any of our three presenters have any suggestions for future conversations of where to go from here in West Hartford? Well, I think one of the things that uh, was an important part of each of the options that the Board of Ed had a chance to vote on is that of um, putting cur more curriculum into the U.S. history curriculum about Native people. So I think one of the things that will happen is that there will be a much, um, that, that people will, teachers will systematically need to address um, in, in history classes um, the study of Native people. So I think that's one of the things that's going to happen. Um, I have to say from my point of view, I, I think um, that uh, there's going to have to be a lot of education of the staff um, and I think this decision is more difficult for adults than it is for students. Um, and frankly, you know, I've been part of Connor for 35 years, so, um, you know, teachers have been, in some ways, been around it longer than uh, students have. Uh, so I, I think that's going to be an important part of what, happen, uh, what happens because um, according to what the, uh, the policy says, um, there can be no symbols in the school and so uh, that's going to take some work um, to do that and to um, 
and to get people to think about i think one way to do it is say ok we're going to go in with paint and paint everything over and that's all going to be gone but as an educator i know that it won't be gone that there need to continue to be discussions about this and it isn't it shouldn't be seen as a punitive thing but it should be seen as a discussion about why our administration thinks this is the right thing to do I believe there was another question up front. Did you? It was just opinions on the board decisions. Well, I just, is the newspaper no longer going to be called the powwow? I mean, are, how, how far can, good. I mean, I just, and would chanting be prohibited? The sort of, the ramifications you described, the, you know, the behavior at games that people sort of felt inspired to engage in, I would hope that would be prohibited to, or I just wondered how far the policy extends down to the gyms. The only thing I would say to that is that I, I just think it's been, I, 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 I don't know if they've thought all the way through that, and I think that's the thing that we, uh, you know, for like at Hall, the reservation is this a fan group that's outside of the school's um, control, so uh, one of the things that um, has been suggested is that the, the, the leaders of both fan groups meet with the superintendent and meet with the principals to be part of the conversation about the rebranding, uh, which would which would be good because you know fan groups are a good thing. We you know we want fans. It's a, a, but um, not around a mascot, you know. And certainly to be named the reservation, I think even our football coach said that's got to go. You know, he's like this. He likes he likes our name warriors but he wants to see that go. So he's even taken a stand on it. The question is how we monitor that, how that's gonna happen. I just don't know um, exactly the, the, the process, right? So it's unclear. I think there's gotta be more conversations though, I, I think. And I would just say one of the hard things that um, Chris mentioned too is uh, we don't control the opposing fans. Um, you know, and I, and I think at Conard in particular, there's a very tight-knit group among um, athletes and coaches who, um, who um, use the, the symbol of the chieftain to represent many uh, what I would call universal values. Um, and so there's a real pride in this name and this symbol. And to a certain degree, I would say, within the school, we control it, but um, we don't control it outside the school. Um, we lose control. And, and really, we lose control outside of these teams. Um, and so I think that's, that's part of the difficulty of this particular decision. Anyone else? Being me, I had to look it up in the dictionary, um, chieftains and warriors, just to see what they actually mean. The, yeah, <laughs> language. Um, and this is the 1828, so I apologize, it's not the new Merriam-Webster. Um, a warrior is just a soldier, and a chieftain is a captain, a leader, or a commander. And it says the chieftains of the Highland clans were the principal noblemen. Um, so as you said, it seems like you can make these strong words in a very positive sense. Um, I just like what you just said about that. Um, I'm a graduate of Conard High School, the first graduating class, and um, my sons and my sister graduated from Hall. I thought the uh, logos were ugly, you know, I, I, I don't miss them, but I hope they could keep the names, and please don't touch the powwow. Don't go too far, we're going to be more Puritan than the Puritans, if we're going to cleanse everything. There has to be some retention of some of those traditions, and people need to be re-educated about that. Um, I major in Latin American history. I've had a profound interest in England in cultures in North America and South America. My wife is Brazilian. She has Native American blood. My mother-in-law raised three or Indian orphans who spoke no Portuguese with the first time I met them. They spoke in their dialects. And they played with my sons every two years when we go down to stay on the farm in Brazil for many, many years. And we'd go out in the woods by themselves, the three Indian boys, and make these beautiful little bows and arrows and little things that, how they learned at five years old, I don't know. But they were a big part of our lives. 
and now they're grown men, they're in their 40s now. Uh, I like the names of the streets. I hope nothing happens to that. Um, I've always taught about American and in history in my world history classes. I was a social studies teacher for 35 years. And I can't think of a more historical people and a more important people to blend into our American history courses. So I, I think that will grow and grow. It just has to be done. It's been lacking. Uh, does anyone have any, uh, I, I know what the um, comment, and then I'll come back here. Is, does anyone want to add to that? Chris? Um, yeah. Um, so when it comes to, uh, you mentioned the powwow, that you would not like to see that go away. Um, uh, personally, I, you know, I, I don't put, you know, see that as offensive. But what is a powwow? Is it a newspaper? No, it's not. <laughs> that's the mistake. Okay, so they're learning something that's not right. Powwows are Native American gatherings that were born out of the 1920s. Um, you, they used to be run by dance societies, um, mainly among the Omaha and the Winnebago's uh, tribes out west. They would have warrior dance societies, but from the 1890s to the 1920s, Native American culture was essentially made illegal. If you practiced your culture, you could be thrown in jail or killed for it. And so a lot of Native practices became secret. Um, and that's where the powwow started to come out because the, the, the ravages of disease, the, the lowering of the uh, population, what happened is uh, communities started to invite other communities to their dances. And that's where the modern day powwow originates from. Um, you don't get that from learning or reading a powwow high school newspaper called, or I mean a high school newspaper called the powwow. That's completely glossed over. Uh, and powwows are a big part of Native culture to this day. It's a, you know, something, of, well, a, somewhat of a pan-Indian movement where uh, this um, uh, uh, protocol of powwow has been taken over by many different tribes. Even though it doesn't originate here, the word powwow actually does originate here in the Northeast. Um, that word translates to the spiritual person or the medicine person of the community. Once again, when you put it as a title of a newspaper, that information gets glossed over. So I don't think it's a matter of um, you know, going too far. I think it's a matter of trying to get it right. I just wanted to say thank you for the forum. Thank you for everybody that came. I grew up in Hartford and I went to junior high and high school in West Hartford. I went to Northwest and I graduated in 1990. And back then, I tried to start a movement. So funny. Against our mascot. And I remember we had one pep rally, and I called Vernon Bellacourt from our payphone with change. Vernon Bellacourt, when he was alive, he was part of the American Indian movement because nobody would listen to me. It's just, I saw this on Facebook, I was like, holy, this is amazing. And it's not even the issue of mass country, I think we have way bigger issues. Um, that our people are dealing with today, everybody's people are dealing with today, just as human beings, you know what I mean? Mascotry isn't the biggest, but I was floored to see this was happening, and floored to see that the Northwest mascot had been retired. Two years ago, I was like, I get a thing to give money every year, and I always throw them away, and that wasn't in the, the, uh, the pamphlet. But um, I just want to say, I'm going to be really brief, I just want to say that I took my son, oh, I'm Tuscarora, he's Tuscarora and Oglala, um, Lakota. And uh, I took him to a Little League game two years ago. His buddy was playing in, and his buddy's uh, team were the Indians. And the opposing team was somebody else. And we were just trying to support the kids. And we get there and we go to sit in the bleachers, and the kid's dad was like, I'm so sorry, Are, is, the, is this name going to be offensive? I was like, not really, you know, no problem. 
we're just here to support daniel and then sure enough we're sitting in the bleachers and some kid from the opposing team it's really about how children are brought up not so much but this kid starts going we're gonna kill you turkey feather indians and where my people come from turkey feathers are actually sacred and only people of a high status would wear these turkey feather capes and they were considered to have medicinal value and uh, so <laughs> my son of course thought he was totally serious and picks up two handfuls of rocks <laughs> and tries to go after this kid. But the kid was really like over the top. Like, I don't know why nobody, I guess they didn't hear him. He was in the outfield, but he kept saying, we're going to kill you. And I was like, what's wrong? What are you doing? He's like, he's going to kill us. He's going to kill us. So it was then when I realized that, again, as an adult, that mask country is a real thing. It, it does affect people. And it affected my seven and a half year old kid. You know, it reminded me. And I went on to go to school go to college and fail out of the Native Studies course <laughs> and, and take a different life path as a musician and, and as an older person I became an activist. I'm on the board of a group called Honor the Earth and we do a lot of work, actually environmental work. But anyways, I digress. It's real. It doesn't mean that we don't work together. Since we all live together in these communities, it's important to honor what uh, non-Native people feel are their traditions and find a dialogue around that like this. So I guess everybody should keep talking. But um, I don't know. It's just amazing. Congratulations to all of you. This never would have happened in 1990. Thank you. Are there any other questions, comments, or would anyone like to comment on the last comment? Uh, we would invite you to come to a free concert, Frank Wallen's giving, uh, on April 27th, which at Hall High School on Monday evening. So we'd love to have you come. It's free. You just come join us. He's from the he's from the Rosebud Reservation. Frank. Yeah. Well, there we go. He's coming. So you come too. I have a question about mascots. I sort of don't have a dog in this fight. My sons went to Conard, but I'm still true blue to my high school mascot from oh, a long time ago and very far away, the Wildcats. So maybe a completely different kind of mascot. But listening to this debate going on, I've, I've been playing with the ideas of mascots, and particularly since both the, uh, the chieftains and the warriors are going to have to sort of rebrand themselves around that name. And um, one, of the, this is just sort of a uh, a, a random idea which came popping out, and I just wanted to, to float it, not as a, as a suggestion, but just to see what are the dimensions of mascots, particularly anything connected with Native Americans. And so the, the idea is, is, what if a mascot was historically grounded? And so as a Gedanken experiment, not something that's actually happened, but suppose that the high school had been named King Philip High School and instead of Hall, and they had called themselves the warriors, but referred to themselves as King Philip's warriors, so historically grounded it in Wampanoag history and so on. Would that be more or less acceptable, or would it still be subject to the same sorts of problems? I can comment on that. I was going to say, I'd love to, but I'm going to let you, Chris. <laughs> Well, uh, as you saw in my presentation, there's, uh, I tried to show a lot of what can't be controlled. And so even a school that has the best intentions and has the best education and really gets their students to understand the history and culture uh, through the mascot of their school, when they go to someone else's school, what's going to happen? And you can't control that. And it, it creates that environment which is hostile for natives to be in. Um, and it's really, if you're a student, uh, it's, an, uh, it's a tough experience to go through. You really don't understand the self-esteem issues that you get hit with because um, you're too young. And like I said, when I first encountered it, I was college age and I really didn't know what hit me. I made a lot of bad choices. Um, I drank too much. I ended up dropping out of Dartmouth. Um, and, I mean, it really affects you negatively. Luckily for me, I had music. Music was the one thing that saved me. Um, 
And it was because of my association with the community at Dartmouth, the Native American community, who actively fought against the Dartmouth symbol um, that really, uh, I don't know, it, it helped me to get through uh, all of the trials and tribulations of the symbol. So even though Dartmouth chose the Dartmouth Indian with the best of intentions, because Dartmouth has a history. Um, Samson Occam was a Mohegan preacher who uh, helped Eliezer Wheelock found Dartmouth College. Um, and that was one of the reasons why they chose the Dartmouth Indian mascot was because of Samson Occam's involvement. But if you looked at the real history, you'd understand that Samson Occam really raised the money for Dartmouth College and Eliezer Wheelock took it all and started Dartmouth on his own. So there's not really any truth to the matter that Dartmouth was originally uh, created as a school for Native Americans. Um, so we miss out on so much by sticking with these uh, mainstream ideas that are based on um, you know, someone else's imagination of what we really are. Um, and you will run into it no matter what. Once those kids, if the, kid, uh, if the kids in the school were completely educated, they're gonna go to another school and they're gonna see some behavior that they're not gonna like and it's going to affect them. I mean, when I was a kid in grade school playing for my, uh, my grade school basketball team, there was one particular school where we would go to where the kids would actually spit on us as we left the locker room. And this happened more than once. And the teachers never did anything about it. So, I mean, the way people look at natives in this country is really, you know, a problem. And it's something that uh, uh, native people are trying to fix. And what everybody, if everybody, anybody in here is wondering why this issue has become such a hot button thing in the last couple of years, it's always been a hot button thing in native country. But social media has allowed us to directly respond so you have Twitter activists and other things that go after pro mascots and college mascots and really try to get the native message across directly from the native community. And that's one of the, you know, natives are really tech savvy um, and they've really taken over Facebook, Twitter, places like that, writers, activists, you name it, um, and have gone to work at trying to fix a lot of these historic wrongs. And we've had success um, but, you know, I know it's hard and I don't think anybody that holds on to um, the mascots and wants to keep them is a racist. I do not believe that whatsoever, not one bit. I believe that they really do have the best intentions, but it creates the environment where racism becomes accepted. And that's what I fight against. Um, and, and I'll do a, a quick follow-up to it. I'm glad that you mentioned the founding of Dartmouth and Morse Charity School in, in Wheelock because that is our local Connecticut history, number one. Um, it is, you know, part of uh, Connecticut's narrative. Um, and, the, and the second is if, if you are interested in learning about quote-unquote historically accurate native mascots, I think the Florida State Seminoles is probably the best example of that being an attempt um, at, at that. So that's just, you know, some some facts to kind of supplement uh, your comment as well as as Chris's. Um, is there any uh, additional questions, comments? <laughs> Jen. Well, I was glad Sarah gave us the definitions of <laughs> of chieftain and warrior, and we were digging around. Actually, Sheila Daly, our curator, is somewhere in here. Um, we we have a you know great collection of of both Hall and Conard High School memorabilia and we were looking through old yearbooks and we were trying to figure out well when did this start when did we saw the names start and and later we saw the imagery and actually the original imagery for hall high school warriors was actually it looked to me like a roman uh with this helmet and like a little nose plate um and i don't know i i guess i'm i'm just wondering what people think what might be possible for future images for mascots and is anything but an animal or something like a yard goat not <laughs> not gonna be offensive you know i'm like she's talking about chieftains and you know i'm thinking scottish highlanders well that's not appropriate either um anyway just wondering if anyone has any thoughts about that 
How about the Stanford tree? That's very, you know, um, solid. Um, no, I, 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 and I'll look to our, our panelists um, as well as the rest of the conversation. I, I, has there anything been any suggestions within the school system? Um, one of the most wonderful things that um, I've been kind of keeping up with this process, knowing that this event is is going on tonight here in West Hartford, and I, I think that the best thing I've I've seen is how um, invested the students are in this conversation. Um, yes, of course, you know you have the adults and the board of education as well as the teachers representing uh, different sides of this conversation and the decision, but the students seem to be a big part of the conversation. And I, it seems like we have some students in the room, but I'm not going to assume. Um, so, you know, I guess perhaps maybe some suggestions from the community uh, moving forward about, you know, what's the proper image uh, and what's the best image to represent the West Hartford communities and the school communities um, to depict warriors and chieftains. And I don't know, are there any options on the table? sort of uh, some consultant who is going to meet with people at both high schools. So I think they're putting together forming committees. I, 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 don't, I think students, right? Students and, and teachers, teachers uh, yeah. Alumni, parents. Right. So I, 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 it's supposed to be done by June 15th. That's what we were told. That's what, that's what they said. I don't know, but. So I guess I have a, a question for the audience. Um, removing the imagery, and after everything we've heard all tonight and the decision moving forward in West Hartford, do the words and the names still carry weight? Does it still carry with that the native perspective, the native, um, you know, racism in those elements? I will put a, a picture in my mind of that word based on you know 40 plus years of living in this in this society. And on um, those two words to me, and the, I'm just one person, but they speak to me of the native connotation. So if someone says to me, oh, we're going to a basketball game and it's the it's the Warriors. I'm not picturing a current American soldier in Afghanistan or um, an ancient warrior from some you know, 500 million years ago, um, although chieftain to me is more that way. But I think it's interesting that those words do, I think, still carry weight. And that comes from someone who I never see what the picture is that shows me what I'm supposed to do. I'm only going by what the word is, and it's most common association in the world that I live in. That carries weight. Um, I'll, I'll uh, uh, thank you very much for your perspective. Um, one of the last comments um, I wanted to have tonight, moving forward, is for everyone to kind of close their eyes and live in, you know, in that, in outside of the realm of what you see right now, and to imagine the last image of a Native American person that you saw, or the last person, Native person in mass media that you saw. You know, is that person a doctor? a lawyer, a teacher, or is it a mascot? And I think that alone does carry certain connotations and understandings of what is in the general American psyche right now. Um, I don't know if anyone else had to, wanted to add to that. No? How's it going? Um, so I'm a current Conrad student. I'm a junior. Um, and one thing I'd like to point out, uh, my brother played, went to Conrad and played on the football team um, and has always spoken of sort of the strong sense of community and family within, found within the football team and the athletic teams as a whole. Um, and I guess part of the, the, what I interpret as the reason why many um, natives are used as mascots is the need for a mascot that represents 
fortitude or resilience or strength and that um, often the chieftain symbol has been used to to represent a warrior someone who will fight um, and that's where I think the the ongoing problem or dilemma is going to be finding uh, a mascot who can represent um, resilience without also representing cultural appropriation and racism uh, it's hard to do I think that was very eloquently said um, I think Connor man you represent your school and your age group very well no, you do. But um, personally, but I'm a lot older. I think the eagles, the wolves, I mean, I love animals, so I have positive associations with these things. The lions, you know, the tigers, the bears, whatever. Anything that, you know, there are certain animals that we, we put these certain traits to. Good hunters, good fighters, you know, a symbol of strength. I don't know. I think... I think that would be cool, something like that. Just a suggestion. I'll shut up now. <laughs> Any of our panelists? I have heard the idea of lions to be um, tied to to Conard, but um, because I I don't know whether the head of the lion pride is a chief, but. I don't know. I've heard people say that, so I don't know. Perhaps that's the direction. I mean, to me, a mascot is an animal, um, and so that's what I would prefer because every time it represents someone who's a person, then I think you're, you're, um, it, it's going to be an issue. So, um, from my point of view, I would prefer that it was an animal, and then you don't have to worry about that. Um, I think going forward, you have a very difficult um, process ahead of you if, if the decision is to hold on to the words but to try to get rid of the imagery. And I'll use Dartmouth once again as an example. The Dartmouth Indian symbol was retired in the 1970s. Okay? I went to school there. I started in 1992. Um, there's a segment of the population at Dartmouth that believes that they are upholding a tradition by perpetuating the Dartmouth Indian. And as freshmen come into campus, they are given Dartmouth Indian t-shirts and they are inundated with this idea of tradition and things of that sort. The college does not take a stand and condemn it. And unfortunately, this behavior continues. And that's why even though the, the, uh, the uh, mascot was retired, a lot of native students, as you saw from that art installation, their Dartmouth experience centers a lot of times around the mascot issue, even though it's not even the mascot anymore. So um, that's why I think at the beginning when we all were asked uh, what we thought about um, the school board's decision, that is interesting. There's really not much else you can say about it because this is kind of new ground here. And my fear is that those that want to hold on to tradition so tightly are being, uh, will be given an avenue by holding on to those names. But I will say this, like I said, over 90% of schools with native mascots um, since the 1960s have changed. And I will say that there is life after those mascots. And it actually is a very good positive one. Um, they are able to uh, establish a school spirit um, that everybody can latch on to uh, that does not degrade or um, belittle a certain population of maybe your own student group. Change is scary, right? That's the, the common uh, quote I hear often. I'm a new director at my own museum, so change is really scary there. Hello. Um, my name is Brian. I'm a current Conard student. Um, I think that when we're talking, if we're talking about the names, and if we change the imagery completely, um, when I hear the name chieftain or warrior, it will always mean um, it will always have a Native American connotation to it. Um, and I don't think that is a bad thing. I think that um, if we do keep the name, 
the education part to what the Board of Ed um, policy included is the best way to go. And I think students at our school will be, um, will have some encouragement to learn about their culture and um, if, uh, if, the, if the name is kept and stuff like that. And I also want to add that um, throughout my process with in researching these um, names in particular, the chieftains and the warriors, particularly the chieftains, but um, I reached out to the local Mo Mohican tribe leaders, and um, which names Kevin Brown and Chief Lynn Malarba, and um, their response was very interesting, just like the board of Eds. But um, they they said that um, they their first question when they heard about the chieftains and the warrior um, was that what at your school is there a mascot um, of someone who dresses up like them and dances around at games and I, I said no and it's been that has been like that since since like Dr. Wilson said the 1980s so times has changed and. Um, they kept, they asked what our native, um, how many native students were in our school, and I was having the conversation with um, our, my principal, uh, Julio D Julio Duarte, and he um, was saying that there are very few students, and he asked, have they came forward and said and with problems, and he said no. So after that, they continued saying. Um, he, as, as a chief of a local Connecticut tribe, the chieftains and the warriors are not offensive, the name. And um, when, uh, for the imagery, they said um, they would be happy to help Connor and West Hartford change the imagery to make it something respectful and um, accurate for our state and our town. And um, I think that uh, their response, he, Kevin Brown is also um, a retired army veteran, so he himself also considers himself a warrior um, in a different kind of perspective. So um, kind of reaching out to a lot of Native Americans, not just the Mohegans, but um, when asked about the name chieftains and warriors in particular and not about the um, general Native American mascots, which include names such as the Redskins, because in my opinion, that is that is offensive and racist, and it is com completely different than the chieftains or the warriors. And um, I think the Board of Ed made the right decision and saying that the um, names can stay, but the images have to change because there are some images that our students use that are um, offensive and. Um, I think as a school, um, there should be a unifying um, image and because there's so many being used at our school. So if we could come together and, well now that we can't use native Im imagery, but um, I, I think that whatever the new image is, we should keep the Native Americans in mind and always have them because also at our school, this whole process with the change and everything has educated our students more than ever. So um, I think that in this whole process has um, it's been the best benefit of this whole thing. I'm very impressed with these Hall and Connor students that are in the audience with their eloquent uh, way of speaking. And um, I, I think I would um, echo you in your final comment that this process in general, um, for the students to be participating in this is probably the best thing that will come. I mean, yes, the removal of um, the imagery is, is definitely a big step moving forward, but just the knowledge and the education and the process that everyone is going through uh, within this community, especially the students, um, being that you're, you are in an age where you are, you know, um, moving forward and choosing the, the next steps in your life. And to understand that not everything is black and white, that there are these, these images of gray, and that there are representations here that mean just more than a picture and a person and a name. Um, I'm, I'm very impressed with this whole process in this community. Do you, do our panelists want to 
think anything? I don't think. Um, it's about 8.35. Um, I did want to mention just a few things as, you know, playing moderator here. Um, some overall uh, concepts that our three panelists discuss as well as in the questions uh, and answers and statements that followed. Um, there's a couple of things that are near and dear to my heart as a director of a museum and a, a historian as well as anthropologist uh, over the past 10 years of working in museums in Connecticut. And one of the, the big things is um, informed decisions uh, and exposure and worldview. Um, the study of, of history and uh, in the state and social studies in the classroom is something that is, is one of those things that's near and dear to my heart. And I heard all of our panelists and even you know questions and answers in, in the audience bring that up, that the knowledge, um, the traditions, the cultures, the celebration of culture um, will inform people to make decisions about the future. Um, you know, to jump to conclusions to these things, uh, it, you know, is, is seems um, not the best way. That this community went through a process from A to Z to say, all right, what do we need to talk to? You know, contacting the, the local tribes and you know, in, inviting speakers in and having community conversations like this is part of that informed decisions. Not to mention that these informed decisions are what the youth are taking part of. Um, they are becoming a part of the conversation. And I think, of, you know, if, if anyone takes anything away, it's that, um, you know, these students are, are creating a sense of uh, pride in their own community and pride in themselves by being a part of this. Um, and if we want to raise, you know, the youth are the future, right? You know, it's not, you know, um, you know, all of us who have been here for generations, it's, you know, raising a, a culture that is well informed to make proper decisions about anything in the future, uh, especially that, that focus on local community. Uh, a few other things uh, that uh, I, I did want to touch on was the idea of empathy and, and how that resonates in, in one's mental health. Uh, being, you know, the local Connecticut community, that has been something that has jumped on, of course, because of our state of affairs and, and what's happened in Connecticut. Uh, but the understanding of, of mental health and how decisions in schools and in youth um, perpetuate moving forward in one's adult life um, and the actions and reactions that take place. Uh, so that's just another thing I think we need to think about moving forward, that, you know, our words have consequences. And whether we think it's the majority or the minority that those are impacting. Uh, moving forward, I think, you know, having that um, always in, in your mind. Um, and also, um, I think one last thing, and then I'll let you all go. Uh, <laughs> uh, I think the media, um, you know, I think all three of our panelists touched on how the media was a big part of this conversation, and, in, in, and nationally as well not just locally. Um, being a director of uh, the Institute for American Indian Studies, where we do focus on archaeology, anthropology, as well as contemporary and historic Native culture, um, I uh, reach out to the Native community quite a bit. And as Chris said, Native people are very tech savvy. They have taken over social media to get these words and this conversation out there. Um, and then, you know, the impact of, of the larger media outlets like CNN and Fox News and, you know, even the fact that we had people interviewing us tonight, you know, and how that's represented on the television in print media. I mean, it was the 1950s article that said, oh, they chose, you know, was it the Warriors or the Chieftains? Those carry weight. Um, the media is a huge part of our lives and I think it will become a more, a larger part of our lives. And the opinions that are presented in media assume to be the opinions of all. And that's also something I think we need to move forward and think about in larger themes of is that what really truly represents our culture here in America? And how does that represent us internationally? Um, how does that be, how does that make us a player in the global picture if this is the images and representations that are brought forward for the youth in the future of what American culture and Native American culture is like? Um, so I think um, 
I will sum this up with a big thanks to Jen for hosting this community conversation and the Noah Webster House, and as well to Chris, Liz, and thank you, Tracy, <laughs> for just being a great part in uh, having those informed decisions and conversations. So thank you. <laughs>